don't believe at least one out of two people will truly smell. What is the basis of the snuff? What is it? What is it? What plant does it come from? Is it a uh, Photamine. Ah. Bufotamine. Are they getting it from frogs? I only hear about bufotamine with frogs. No, from a nut. And it's from the seeds. Mm -hmm. ah. They grind it up. Mm -hmm. So this is early paraphernalia. Um, or art. Useful art. <laughs> Alter objects. That's what I think but, they are. Yeah, but you look at this stuff and you say, well, in some way, this is a device. You know, this is a tool for altering your consciousness. Now, wouldn't you want a little jaguar, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, straw if you were snuffing up something that was going to... I, I don't know. Show some respect. Uh, yeah, precious objects. Yeah. There they are. Yeah. <laughs> Instantly in another world. <laughs> and Richard Schultes uh, did a great job studying um, the uh, natives that use the cohoba snuff here, uh, which is a DMT snuff. And it uh, gets you in another dimension really fast. And sometimes uh, they actually would use this for kind of magic. Like, now we're going to get this strange beast that is hovering above me to go over to the next village and attack so-and-so. You know? To bring the rain, <laughs> you know, maybe, or, maybe, or to or have the crops. Yeah. Exactly. What Get it, rid of the locusts. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Whatever uh, needed to be done. Hmm. Psychedelic. Okay. So it's it's coming out. You know, it's kind of leaking out the edges. Stuff I never heard in high school. You know that we are surrounded by and recovering our psychedelic uh, roots. And uh, now, stuck him in there. okay, so if you have a snuff tray, why can't you have a dab glass art thing? Functional it glass. Func puts the fun in functional. There you go. These are, these are, this is <laughs> art that you would see if you went to Denver. You would go to galleries that were very high-end and very gorgeous and have huge glass cases and have large, and some of these are quite large. We were there, uh, they had a, a ship, and I've probably they always have a ship of some sort, but like, you know, a whole bunch of people could sit around it. And, yeah, the know. Chillums were the uh, uh, cannons, as you can imagine. Something coming yeah. off the ship, yeah. Um, okay, so... Building visionary culture, the great uplifting of humanity beyond its self-destruction is the redemptive mission of art. <sighs> can we do it, folks? I think we can. Come on. But if we really. do do it, it's going to be art. Yeah. Art is going to lead the way. How else can we convince people except beautifully? You have to do it. You have to entice people. It has to be beautiful. So exactly. we're enticing people with art. Well, I think that the visionary artists, uh, the contemporary visionary artists, starting perhaps with uh, Ernst Fuchs, post-war, um, this was the first artist uh, just recently died. I'm so sorry to, uh, to say, just in November uh, the, the uh, 9th. He was an uh, inspiration to every visionary artist, really, uh, who knew his art, which... It, just extraordinary, because he was the first to be able to um, realistically describe the strange, amazing beings and lights and uh, feelings that one might have in a psychedelic experience. I think and he was one of the early ones of our generation or the generation before us to come out. 
he and didn't basically like say this to has talk been about it that much. No. But he but he did. He, he wrote about it. He he admitted uh, he had tried uh, peyote in the fifties in in uh, New York, and uh, that this kind of showed up in his Moses and the Burning Bush and things like this. So he was reviving a early technique uh, by Van Eyck that was of uh, oil glazes over uh, egg tempera. So there was this masterful uh, technique married with this completely far out uh, experience. So when you have a psychedelic experience, you can see the kind of scrawls and things that wind up on the cave walls and stuff like that. It's not an easy thing to describe. You know, people have been trying to do that and probably will continue to do it. Uh, our dear friend Matty Carwine, this is a piece called Grain of Sand, and it's like a it's like a donut, uh, I guess, of interdimensional oddities. And then inside of the donut is the exact same uh, painting reversed. Um, and made tiny, of course. So it took him about two years. No, nobody would do anything that insane. But uh, psychedelics two things that I definitely, think. <laughs> that's, that's what it kind of points to. But there are two things I think have always called you, and me too, to Maddie's work. And one of them was that he got a cover of Santana. <laughs> and by doing the cover for Santana, I don't know how many of you still know Santana. You must know Santana, right? I mean, that's old, but he did the, the – do you have the Santana cover next? No. I'm not sure. It's okay. Well, oh, anyway. Yeah. But he did the Santana cover. But then he also created the Olive Sanctuary, which was, you know, the first person that we knew that created uh, – a sanctuary from paintings. He tried to create a sanctuary with paintings, and then he ended up having to sell off all the paintings. So they created a Duratrans chapel, the Olive Sanctuary, but it always, I think it always called us that we wanted to build a temple, and there he had done it, but had, had not been able to keep all the paintings together. So we've been keeping paintings together for our temple. Exactly. That's, That's we, the we've idea. We've made it our life's work. Yeah. 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 Well, when I was a kid and just seeing, uh, like, Culture was Life magazine, you know, and I crack this baby open and I'm like 12 or something and I'm like, hmm, LSD art. Yeah, sounds interesting, you know, and so. Uh, oh, but you don't have the picture of yourself in the newspaper in Columbus, Ohio, where he actually was 12 years old and he did a paper on LSD and he got in the paper for it. He got in the newspaper because he did this. No, but seriously, you were interested in it when you were really. I young. was a young champion Told before you. it got illegal. But, it was, but then you didn't try it until you were 21. So 12, That's 21, true. you know. Yeah. Yeah. You waited. I did. Uh, well, what happened at Woodstock? You know, probably, you know, that many hundreds of thousands of people tripping at one time. Had, might not have ever happened before. So it kind of made a watershed uh, in human history, in a way. You know, that young people got together, uh, somehow managed to have a great time listening to music, not hurting each other. And um, there's, uh, you know, changed the world. Um, festival culture is still kind of the echo, I'd say, of this Big Bang. The uh, boom. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, I like to say it's the opposite of war. You're waging peace with your art. And the great visionary tribe that has gotten together to launch boom, people like Android Jones and Carrie Thompson and Luke Brown and, and uh, Amanda Sage and uh, all these artists are, are uh, doing phenomenal work and taking people to new realms. You know, the dance parties there. It's a new kind of ecstasy. You could say that the, uh, they're preparing for a world of refugees in a way. You know, they know how to have fun in a refugee camp, basically. They know, you know? how to live and, and, and <laughs> set up a community. I mean, the Burning Man, it's fifty to 80,000 people for a week. 
and they set it all up. We'll show pictures. This kind of knowledge may come in handy someday. Uh, Yeah. The Rainbow Gatherings have happened since Woodstock. How to uh, share. How to be altruistic. Exactly. This is what you learn at festivals. Because it's free, you know, and it happens every July 4th. And it's a celebration of true American spirit, the Rainbow Tribe, uh, the coming together of all the tribes and uh, sharing what they have. And sharing the wisdom, sharing the food, and sharing the fun. This uh, is us in the, Brazil, 25,000 people, twice. We, we went to Brazil. They have big festivals in Brazil. Yeah. There we are painting our mural. We're going to paint this mural some more. We've painted this mural in four different cities. Yeah. Antheon Village was the our first kind of... Um, offering at Burning Man, and it was uh, with, in uh, conjunction with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and uh, Matt Atwood, who's uh, running an algae systems green technology firm today. But uh, Entheon was a name that, that came to me just uh, as a, a place to discover the God within, which is a normal, natural uh, idea. And uh, the pantheon is the was the all of the gods, so the entheon would be the god within. Um, and so we had a little uh, a camp there. At, and of course, Burning Man is mecca for all psychedelic users, I suppose, uh, or uh, art freaks. Too, it's an incredible yeah. art art festival to see, you know, the structures and the things that people build. Absolutely. Out in the middle of nowhere. Well, David Best is the best of the temple builders, or one of the best, for he sure. Is the best and uh, and there, you, there you have it. Uh, the uh, psychedelic culture really today, I think, happens a lot online too. You got maps. You got their. Uh, uh, this is probably the most important information that's happening uh, today. The science around psychedelics and. Uh, sharing the uh, idea that this is a way to get people past their trauma. We're experiencing a lot of trauma in this violent age. I think that it's time that we start to find ways to uh, integrate our experiences that uh, take us beyond our, our normal equipment. We've been given these medicines in order... This is the way that ancient humanity used to get perspective on their reality and used to uh, put things into order. So it still works. And being more peace, become more peaceful people and become more integrated in a, as community. Yeah. Healing. So anyway, this is, this, is one of the, this is one of the great breakthroughs of, MDMA. Uh, of psychedelic psychotherapy is MDMA, with, uh, especially with uh, PTSD. Because there's so many people coming back from war that are... You know, I mean, I think even our uncles and grandparents, you know, came back with PTSD, but there was nothing to do. And many of them ended up institutionalized or on drugs for the rest of their life or just, you know, like this this is helping people. They, they, you know, Rick Doblin with with MAPS was able to get Jordanians, uh, Israelis and Palestinians in a room together to learn about this to learn about this. People who would normally never even talk to each other or would never, you know, want to sit in a room together would hear about this psychotherapy for their, all of their people coming back from war. So there's, there's hope there. Um, and Reality Sandwich uh, keeps a lot of people informed about psychedelic culture. Airwid is a website certainly I hope everybody knows about. And Database. The, no, wait. Database. This is mm-hmm. if you want to know anything about anything about drugs, and if you want to know what combinations, how much, you know, what's good, and also they have an art site, so they'll show you a lot of visionary artists on yeah. there. They represent yeah. a lot of things. Exactly. Um, and uh, so Reset Me is a new um, site that was created by Amber Lyon, a, a CNN reporter who. Uh, had followed the slave trade all over the world and had done a really stunning job uh, in uh, CNN and had gone really far. And then uh, she had discovered things about the uh, psychedelic world and she wanted to do a story on it with CNN. And she was getting a lot of, mm, nah, 
you know, Vara, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. And she was starting to see, oh, wait a minute. You mean, so you didn't do this story, you didn't do this story. So she was beginning to see much more censorship in the news media and a lot more than she was comfortable with. So she left CNN and started uh, uh, this new uh, website, Reset Me, and has been sharing stories of uh, soldiers who have recovered. Uh, it's really a very human. Uh, you'll find stories of people who were transformed um, and uh, what's new in psychedelics as well there. So I guess it's, I think it's time that uh, it's, we state the obvious that, uh, you know, entheogen should be considered a civil right. It's some way that uh, humanity should have access to these tools that it's had access to that's not criminalized. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the drug war is really a, a war against higher consciousness and conscience. Uh, and perhaps a greater corporate war against nature. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, people who take entheogens are an oppressed minority. And if you look at the pot smoking statistics, perhaps an oppressed majority. Um, entheogens are really the, the use, the outlawing of plants that have a long, venerable, religious traditional usage is anti-sacramental. The use of entheogens is a fundamental human right to cognitive liberty and a civil right to freedom of religion. Here the Unio... Yes. Uh, this is why we're so, we are so honored to be, to be uh, invited to, to a uh, school where they're studying spirituality and including this in uh, as a as a, at least a topic that we could at least discuss the spiritual aspect because you were saying the most important thing happening today there's a lot of breakthroughs in medicine it's but true. I feel like it's a tremendous uh, breakthrough to consider this uh, people's spiritual life and people are more and more thinking about it in that way well the UDV is uh, extraordinary uh, really run by this uh, fella kind where's, of in the Jeffrey? center uh, Jeffrey Bronfman He's the guy that's kind of financially responsible for heading the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that happened in 93, actually. So he was connected with the Peyote Church at that time. And uh, at the time he was looking uh, to defend them, he got introduced to this other psychedelic church, the UDV. And he had an instant connection. And he said, I've got to bring this to the United States. And so he did. And now there's several branches. They won their right to use uh, but they, but, uh, but ayahuasca. It's a highly controlled uh, kind of uh, thing. They have to account for every ounce, you know, that they uh, that they use. But they have a Schedule One license. They go to the airport, meet the DEA, and uh, sign a little uh, note and say, "Thank you very much for my trippy medicine." DEA, you got to give it to me. So I was, um, was going to say that before Jeffrey uh, went on the journey of, of of bringing the peyote to legality for Native people, he was he was a, a Zen monk. He he lived in a monastery for like ten twelve years, and then he kind of he he knew that you know getting closer to his spirituality was really important, but. He wasn't getting that, that, that connection with the divine that he remembered getting back in the day when he was in college, and he took, it, took psychedelics, which sent him to meditation. So many, like everybody, we would go to retreats, and every Buddhist would say, you know, Alex would say to them, well, when did your psychedelic, you know, when, no, no, he would say, when did your spirituality begin? Like, why did you decide to meditate? What happened? And it was always, you know, the same story. Always the same story. They took psychedelics, then they gave up psychedelics to go study meditation. So Jeffrey did that, and then after 10 or 12 years, he felt like he, he wanted to go back to that powerful, connected, interconnected feeling that he had had. Right. And he, and he went, and, and the peyote people he were in trouble. The, exactly. Well, it was really interesting because he was feeling like uh, 
hey, I want uh, to have these visions again, but I don't want to have a, a situation where there's no mentors. What I really love about Zen, um, the Zen Buddhism, was that it was within a system of mentorship and uh, guidance, and uh, that you know there wasn't this idea of, of just tripping by yourself in your room or something, you were with a community whose purpose was to evolve spiritually. And that was your collective um, motivation and intention. And in fact, you read the bylaws every week, you know, that you do this, you know, they do it every two weeks, you know, if you want to really go for it. But you don't have to go to every session, but every two weeks they take uh, ayahuasca from eight to midnight and, uh, and you know, during the end of it, they didn't. It's mostly quiet or some music and stuff. But during they the had end, to create a real structure in order to be considered by the U U.S. and the FDA and DEA and all that and every, FB, everybody to be considered a religion. They had to set up this incredible structure, which they did. That's brilliant. Yeah, them. they're building there are a temple now. people doing ayahuasca in various rituals all over the world. Absolutely. All over the planet. You can't. You don't go to a part of the world really. I mean, maybe you know, I'm sure China and whatever. Yeah. But there are many parts of the world where intelligent people yeah. are getting together and uh, experiencing this in community. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the. Uh, but he had to do the structure because he wanted to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. To and he do didn't it want to break the law. And he's still fighting. He I wanted really, to change the law. He wanted to build a church and they wouldn't this town didn't want to build a church it's kind of like you know you keep going to the new level of acceptance yeah. by the community exactly he had to fight that legally too and he won yeah. so now they're building their temple in Santa Fe Jeffrey I love you freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor it must be demanded by the oppressed one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. <sighs> Sacralized nature. Environmental experts tell us we have very little time to shift. Entheogens heal souls, transform habits of consumption to turn around the eco-catastrophe in progress. Hey, it's one of the ways that we might change minds fast. You know, if if it uh, if there was a sacramental upwising, uh, the uh, so the great Good Friday experiment that happened on 420 back in 1962 in Marsh Chapel was the first um, demonstration that psychedelics, the scientifically demonstrated that sci that psychedelics can elicit a mystical experience. Now, the man that conducted the uh, experiment was Walter Pankey, and he was both a, doc a psychiatrist, doctor of psychiatry, and a doctor of theology, of religion, uh, from Harvard, Harvard Divinity School. And so he had divinity students, and uh, 30 of them, in the basement of Marsh Chapel, when Howard Thurman, who was Martin Luther King's mentor, actually, uh, gave a sermon on Good Friday. And uh, so about 65% of the divinity students after their, um, uh, they took a questionnaire after the whole thing, which Panky had worked painstakingly on, very elaborate kind of questionnaire, which has been further refined. The criterion of a mystical experience. What is a mystical experience? That was, that was the body of his research. And he worked with many clergies from the main religions to determine what would what would be the what would be the uh, criterion for a mystical experience. Yeah, which is wonderful and uh, should be included in any. Uh, I think we included in the divi divinity stuff. issue of the Cosmic Journal. We right. Have, we have the criterion in there. Right. Which is like unity, transcendence of space and time, ineffability, etc. Eight, eight categories. Uh, Roland Griffiths down in Johns Hopkins has replicated this uh, kind of experiment famously in his uh, multiple psilocybin studies at Johns Hopkins, which have also... Uh, Within the last decade, he's still doing yeah. it. Yeah. 
And his big study came out in 2006 that basically said 65% uh, of our participants in our very tightly controlled experiment had a full-blown mystical experience, which would be a God contact, basically. And uh, so now it is uh, twice proven from double-blind scientific experiences. Now, if you had to go looking for science, that would prove the existence of God, I would say that this stu these studies actually go farther than anything else that I can think of. I don't think they prove the existence of God. I think they prove the experience of God. I mean, that's really what people have had. And every, every single criterion that you can come up with, this is the experience that people have. So that is the proof that they have, but also that the mystical experience heals. Yes. That it is a healing force. That if you have a mystical experience, your chances of healing, whatever it is you're trying to heal, are improved. And they have proven this scientifically. They're, they're still proving it. I mean, they're, they're using it on various populations. Uh, clergy, they've got a clergy study coming up. If anybody knows clergy, I mean, it's... It's not, it's not easy to always find. Psychedelic uh, virgins who are psychedelic clergy. Psychedelic virgins who yeah. are clergy. I mean, but, yeah, uh, yeah they're, looking, they're continually looking for studies. If you're interested, you check out Johns Hopkins. And uh, I think that it's um, really, uh, Anxiety really exciting. Anxiety around, around terminal illness. Right. It's they, a big study where they talk, where they let, there's a great, Documentary. If you like documentaries and you are interested in this subject, you ought to check out a new understanding, the science of psilocybin, which has fairly recently come out, uh, where they have all these doctors. This guy, these guys. I mean, Roland, I don't think Roland Griffiths is in it, but a bunch of but a bunch of the doctors at, at Johns Hopkins are in it. Right, and NYU. And there's NYU. there are psilocybin studies going on all over. Uh, Yale, and Yale Harvard. is starting up one. Uh, uh, Harvard's cranking UCLA. back. So it's uh, the psychedelics are returning uh, in a uh, to to great benefit in uh, medicine, and I'd say by the looks of Art Basel, to great effect in the art world as well. Uh, and uh, Arnold Toynbee uh, was a historian of civilization, and. His uh, idea was that there was a spiritual center to every great civilization, and that when they wander away from that spiritual center, they start to break down. Now, um, so then we get to this idea of what is the civilization that's emerging today? It has to be a planetary civilization. I mean, that's obvious. You know, it's a world, it's a global civilization that has to occur because of the Internet. We're connected. We're connected with everything. We have to start. Our problems transcend our nation states. Pollution, climate change, all these things, you're never going to solve it one nation or one little community. You know, you've got to have uh, decisions that are moral made uh, from on high and uh, supported throughout a structure. So to find the sacred center, of course, you know, I think it's very hard to say that in American culture right now. But thinking of planetary civilization and thinking of a spiritual center, what could it be? I don't believe in this caliphate stuff. I don't believe that there should be one religion dominating everyone. I think that we've seen that that is a mess, and it's, uh, and it's only about fascistic control. And, and so do we just throw out religion and let all of the fanatics and uh, fundamentalists own the word religion and they use it, but we don't have a way to make religion the way we would like it to be? I mean, I, I think that this is more, it's becoming, well, with all the groups that are getting together and all of the... Uh, gatherings, it seems that this is, uh, you know, very much defi defining itself as a uh, spiritual path for people sometimes. It's the way that they, they unify instead of divide. Well, once you get in touch with the mystical experience, you're in touch with the source of all great religion and uh, sacred 
the art as well, as uh, Alana pointed out at the beginning. Uh, you've got the uh, various forms of religion. Uh, William Blake uh, saw it the same way, that, there, that uh, the real humanity is the genius. And uh, as defined, you know, kind of like the human soul, the human spirit, the, the, uh, and that that's the different cultures are seeing this same dimension uh, through different lenses, different cultural lenses. They're in contact with this one divine intelligence that is beyond uh, understanding, really, uh, but is nevertheless the source of everything and is the divine imagination. And so it is only through the arts that we know any of these great world religions. And what if your... Uh, spirituality, your religion, was creativity. If it was, then uh, you would need to study all of the world religions in order to understand your religion, which was creativity and art. So uh, uh, it's a way of including know about any and cultures incorporating. At all, if it weren't for art. Yeah. Art and artifacts, the things that people leave, the architecture. It's creative. The and sacred it's... literature, right? Yeah, the singing, dancing, the temples, everything. So visionary mystical experiences are humanity's most direct contact with God and are the creative source of sacred art and the wisdom traditions. The best currently existing technology for sharing the mystic imaginal realms is a well-crafted artistic rendering by an eyewitness. By a skilled eyewitness. That's my only modification. <laughs> People are eyewitnesses all over the place, and some of them are just learning, and it may not really translate that message as well as some artists whose work really does. People see that spirit in the work, but it's a well-crafted a well-crafted uh, object by a skilled artisan. So uh, when people are making art, they're in their flow. They're in their flow state, their creative zone. And they're basically downloading creative energy, which is the source of the universe. I mean, what else are we made up of? This cosmic intelligence. You're surfing the cosmic creativity in your work. That's a pure connection. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a priest. You don't need uh, anything else, but you have that direct connection. So that will always be, people will always make art, whether they get paid for it or not, because they love it. They love to do it. They have a connection with their creator doing it, their creative thing. So Mark Henson, one of the great, Moksha artists that have come uh, down is probably going to be represented there. He shows that uh, force, that love force that counters uh, violence. And he shows us uh, the shambles of our civilization and the, uh, the worlds to come, the worlds to create. The great artists like uh, Robert Venosa here, he... Uh, was able to portray that glistening inner jewel-ish realm of the psychedelic worlds. And his partner, Martina Hoffman, um, this was her ay ayahuasca experience, kind of connected with the web of life. You want to talk about that? I, I guess I, Vibrata is my sister in, in abstraction, but I'm seeing so much more abstraction in visionary art and psychedelic uh, influenced art now. And uh, my work has always been abstract in that realm and always influenced by my experience of psychedelics. So, but Vibrata, look at her. Chromodorus, she's such a great painter. Isn't she wonderful? Mm -hmm. Doesn't this remind you of that stuff with the in that cave that the mushroom-headed elves were around? Mm -hmm. Mars One. Yeah, Mars Juan is really one of the most exciting painters around today. And he's a, uh, famous for these kind of, uh, you know, uh, explosions of uh, kind of collisions of dimensions, you know, that, that kind of come like a train wreck, 
you know, of multiple kind of uh, symbol systems and things, you know, what are these things, you know, that crash? And uh, there's a whole number of artists that have uh, been called the, uh, the Further Collective. Uh, and you got uh, Mar uh, Mars One, um, Mario Oliver. Martinez, and uh, then uh, Oliver Vernon. Uh, Vernon, who's over there, the man mountain that he is, and uh, Damon Sewell, I believe, were working on this. Uh, large men. Amazing. They paint large paintings. Yeah. Now, this is Mars One's new thing that was on the playa. Yeah. It's huge. Really one of the greatest. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's doing this other thing with this. Trippiest uh, uh, things on the trippy playa balls. this year. Trippy yeah. balls. Tripping balls. Now, yeah. what? <laughs> is this is this paint is this painted or is this it looks Weechel. No, this is this is Weechel beaded. This is yeah. here at Art Basel. This is I wanted to bring you up to date, you know. So this is on view today. Um at Art Basel is uh Mario's tripping balls. Awesome. Wow. And Anna uh, Roberts. Yeah. Psychedelic Homer Simpson. <laughs> Psychedelic What's this guy's name? Occupy. Uh, Guy Fawkes. Guy Fawkes. Guy yep. Fawkes. Yeah. And uh, the Occupy movement. Yeah. Uh, Kerry Thompson. He's going to be at Gem and Jam this year. And uh, so a lot of these artists you'll find at the festivals. You don't always find them in the Soho galleries and things like that. Soho's and cool. what the hell? Why is that? You know, what is it about this? You know, part of it is, I think, that some of this is the art of the 99%, you know, not so much art of the 1%. This appeals to people so much they get tattoos on, you know, like uh, Zavi is, a, you know, an interplanetary uh, elf. That mural of Zavi, it's on the corner of, it's the, the epicenter of hippiedom, right there. Hate and Masonic, yeah, hate Masonic. right there, jamming they have some on very hate. Very good friends that are muraling over there in the Hate Ashbury. Beautiful too. work. Luke Brown, just one of the most astounding uh, visionary artists. Uh, this is his uh, Sa Salvia Dali Norum, I think. Uh, it's hard to tell if you're inside or outside. This is an early Baphomet. Um, Chris Dyer, is, uh, he just did a mural down here at Wynwood. You can really see the Peruvian influence. We were looking at those Peruvian heads that were just like opening up and opening up. Well, yeah, he has that exactly. kind of patterning. Yeah, and a kind of cartoon-like uh, character. But, okay, so you see a lot of webs and things like that in all this art. That is one of the um, kind of form constants that Heinrich... Kluver described in Mescal and Mescaline and the Mechanism of Hallucinations, an early psychedelic uh, study done in Germany. Uh, after Mescaline was discovered in 1897. It was synthesized uh, by Arthur Hefter. And uh, so we've got the, the science of psychedelics happened in the uh, 20th century pretty much, but it was kicked off by that. And uh, Android Jones is probably just one of the most exciting uh, visionary artists out there today. He's making art before your eyes on mammoth screens at Grateful Dead shows, uh, along with his buddy but Jonathan it's, it's all, Singer. What does he call it? Metal? What does he oh, call it? he calls it electromineralism. Um, see, he's another Sagittarian. He was born just a few days ago. And... Uh, he likes to work with a uh, an arrow of light. Uh, he works with a Wacom tablet uh, for uh, uh, digital freaks and uh, does quite an amazing uh, job on the fly and, uh, and in projections uh, at all the Grateful Dead concerts. Uh, he and uh, Jonathan Singer have been just killing it. So this is uh, uh, Jonathan light shows. works. Yeah, light, light shows. shows and projections, the moving image, but also just the moving abstract image. It's very, very 
part of the psychedelic culture. And exactly. The visionary culture. Yeah, you're so right. Light shows have always been part of it. Projections on big buildings. It's, yeah. It's just going on. And, um, well, what we see then is this uh, light. The light continues on through all of these artists. And Amanda Sage is just one of the most brilliant uh, teachers of it. And... Uh, portrayers of it. So visionary art is a manifestation of sacramental culture and uh, sharing the mystic visionary art with a spiritually awake audience may confirm the authenticity of the vision. It kind of validates the visionary state. And uh, the visionary artists are creating a compelling body of evidence, an encyclopedia of higher dimensional beings. Um, and so the mystic artists uh, paint the transcendental realms from observation, and uh, that was my uh, uh, DMT experience, the collective vision that wa later wound up in uh, the Rose Planetarium uh, to be witnessed <laughs> in, in a dome. Uh, so I guess the idea is you come into the evolutionary uh, you know, creative force that's working with uh, the artist, you come at it by uh, letting it into your mind, and it takes you back where uh, the inspiration happened. Uh, and uh, so the people who've had a mystical experience, they may awaken to a greater conscience, you know, um, and uh, we can turn on the collective light body. Good old Simon Spongo. Spongle and doing a collaborative art, uh, I think, uh, uh, accelerates our creative um, lives. And here, Mars and I uh, got to work together on a Bicycle Day, which is an event that Allison and I th throw in uh, uh, oh, we, San we Francisco used to every year. It's for us, but we always go. San Francisco, April 19th, that's where we'll be celebrating Bicycle Day. And this is. What we're celebrating was the first LSD trip. Yeah, that, it uh, was ended up in a, in a in a famous bicycle ride. That's right, at uh, by uh, Albert Hoffman. And uh, so anyway, it's a kind of crescendo time for psychedelic culture. Uh, the big smackdown hasn't happened yet because it's you know the science has been steadily building. The, the truth is that this stuff is uh, helpful for people. So we have, so we have country western um, psychedelia. If you haven't heard this song, you really ought to hear it. Check this it song. out. Sturgill Simpson, Turtles on, All the on, Way Down. It was on David Letterman. Yeah, this is a famous country western singer who does psychedelic uh, songs. Okay? Now, uh, ASAP Rocky, I don't know whether. Whether you know ASAP Rocky, but he's one of the hottest hip-hop artists around today from Harlem and did a song this year called LSD. And it became one of the most popular uh, ever, you know. So this is out, you know. We're doing our sacred mirrors. I, uh, we s s invented them, basically, the concept of them, or Allison gave us the idea in uh, 19. There we were, doing a performance in a gallery in Boston. Uh, there's two charts. Alex came up with this idea that he would do these charts. It was a light, the performance was called Life Energy, and we discussed Life Energy. It actually was Alex's first lecture ever. After that, he got a position teaching at NYU for 10, 12 years, something like that. But no, but he, you know, he was just beginning to do a talk, and the talk was on life energy. And so he, he made these charts so people could reflect on their life energy. He did a lot of other things, too, but it was, this yeah. was, this was Allison very Allison said popular. that uh, she thought that I ought to do a whole series of paintings based on that idea. I did. And so. And he did it. Yeah. And you see, you tell each other things. If you have a studio together, you tell each other things to do all the time, but you don't always listen. But he did. With that, he did, and it, was, it worked out good. <laughs> well, in June 3rd, 1976, we had a huge acid trip that, where we melted down into what we call the universal mind lattice. And, uh, well, this is 
is Alex's neat drawing. You can see how neat it is. And this is my more messy drawing. But we could see that we were talking about the same. We were there. It's just our ability to, to articulate it uh, became different. Different. Because we both decided that this was the most important thing that ever happened to us. And it should be the subject of our art. Subject being the most impor important thing that an artist has to consider. And being an artist is their subject. So we felt like, why not choose the most important thing? Why go any less than that? And we had already been doing our art around the self and more, more, more introspective uh, revelations and things like that. But this became yeah. our, our subject. The sacred mirrors, uh, it's really, uh, we're set up to, to get to this moment of the un, uh, universal mind lattice, which was outside of time, beyond gender. You were a toroidal kind of fountain and drain of light interconnected with an omnidirectional network of similar cells that were kind of circulating with this light. All of the recordings of all of your lifetimes were uh, circulating in your soul knowledge right there. And you were a point um, that was interconnected with every other being in the web because you were all sharing the same energy. The energy was love. And it was so revolutionarily weird and, and it felt true. It felt true in a way that I'd never experienced you know it's kind of like you wake up from a dream and then you say wow that felt so real you know and and uh so it was like that from the body you know like wow that thing in the body seemed so real really weird waking up from the material world yeah into the true world yeah the world that's underneath it's, it all and you know it's totally like the cave you know plato's cave uh, so the psych psychic energy system leads you through the, uh, all of the different physical systems and the skins, and then it gets to the psychic energy system here where the, you start to see the light body and try to integrate the mystical systems and uh, the different systems of the uh, acupuncture meridians and points, chakras and auras and things like this. The identity with the body starts to melt down and uh, become interconnected with the environment until this uh, sort of white light. Uh, and uh, so that's what the sacred mirrors are. Where are these are. paintings? Where are <laughs> these important works? Where are these life-size experiences that you can stand in front of and really palpably feel like you're, you're, you, there's a battery you know, between you and it? Where are they? In storage. They are not on view right now. And they've been on view all over the world. They have. They've had many viewings. But unless they have a permanent place, they won't be there when you want to be there, when you want to see them, if you want to have that experience. So we felt at some point that we should keep them and create a public uh, offering and, and a space for them. But this was my, uh, you know, I, you know, psychedelics gave me an essentialized worldview uh, that became the subject of my art for the last 40 years. And uh, it certainly, certainly Alex uh, directed me toward it, even though I was creating it in a sort of a secret other body of work. And then Alex came into my life and said, no, this is really important what you're doing. But this piece was really like seeing the universal mind lattice from above and looking down at it. If I were to take a tomograph and, and, you know, trim off a layer, you know what I mean? You would see that this is, was my symbol, just a pointed, like a sh unsharpened stick kind of symbol pointing to that exquisite experience. And then this is, uh, you know, I call this jewel net of Indra because in the, in the Hindu uh, pantheon, there's Indra, the god of space. And in the abode of Indra, there's this net that stretches infinitely in all directions and at every facet of that net, everywhere the net crosses, there's a jewel that's so highly polished that it interreflects every other jewel in the net. And that was such a beautiful description of, of, of our experience of, of uh, the universal mind lattice in a way that I called it jewel net of Indra.
And then this is called One in Many. And this is what my work is made of is uh, 100 squares, not elongated rectangles like they look like on the screen, but actual squares. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's 100 of them, and they go through the spectrum. So there's particles, there's waves, there's cells, there's systems, and it's all made up of this, this grid of 10 by 10. And this is many. So whether, whether my work, uh, well, keep going. This is chaos, order, and secret writing. This is the three, this is the three caballeros of my work, really. It's, it, chaos is the symbol for uh, chaos, order plus entropy. So you have order, but then you have entropy. You have it's all falling apart in these beautiful ways. So you have all the, these, these hundred unit squares just exploding and just floating out into space beautifully. And then there's chaos, then there's order. This is my... Uh, this is my symbol for the, the bliss realm, the place where we're all feeling interconnected and made of light, that, that place that you go to, the universal mind lattice, uh, in Alex's work. So chaos would be the material world. This would be the spiritual, the, 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 the inner world, the inner realm of perfection. And then the secret writing is what I saw when I first saw God. When I... I, I had the experience of, you know, they say recreationally using psychedelics for quite some time and then taking myself into a dark room and quietly taking the substance and making it an inner experience and seeing the secret writing all over everything. It was like wafting in the air. It was on the walls. It was over my body. It was everywhere. And what does it mean to me? What did it mean? Because I couldn't read it. It was the ineffable. My piece that I just finished that's in the show, Realms of the Unpronounceable. That's what I feel about the secret writing. and It's, it's the nameless presence. But it, it, it represents the creative urge. To make symbols is to be creative. It's an inner world that becomes an outer thing. We, make, we have these thoughts, and they're not art when they're in our heads. They're only art when they become evidence. So it's this inner world, becomes an outer thing, and it's always, always a symbol. I mean, everything in the material world is a symbol. My hair is a symbol, right? This chair is a symbol. This, you know, e everything is a symbol. So everything we make, everything that we think of and then we make is a symbol. I just created these symbols to represent the creative uh, manifestation, the force of creative manifestation. Well, that triad. So there yeah. we are, having uh, our inner experience. Yeah. So maybe that was, uh, it, it, that was meant to symbolize our MDMA experience where uh, we both saw the chapel. That's that was right. another one of those simultaneous uh, visions. So after that, because uh, uh, we this started talking. This is us in our basement in Brooklyn. Yeah, in 1985. Making the sacred mirrors frames. So we sculpted them together, and then we exhibited them there. That was at, their first uh, exhibition. In the uh, in sacred, New York. Yeah, in the new museum. And uh, so you stand in front of them, and then we installed them there at uh, Chelsea for five years. We had an installation of the sacred mirrors, and surprising people kept coming and kept getting more wait, popular. Wait, wait, don't, don't go. I just want to say this was our cons. It was a, always meant to be temporary because it was a rental. We had the whole fourth floor in Chelsea, which is where all the galleries are now. But it was really like it was 27th Street. Yeah. It was like going in there when it was just becoming a gallery place. It was like all like completely we 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 sanded those floors. We poured floors. We took the whole 12 thousand square built feet. We walls. built it out temporarily to show, you know, all to see whether there was a, you know, support for having a chapel, a place to meet, a place to gather for our community. And there we are in Chelsea gathering. And it just that people just came and came and we, we created the full moon ceremony. We just had our 159th consecutive full moon ceremony. That's about, that's almost 14 years. It'll be 14 years come January. There's Dr. Ho Dr. Yeah. Groff. Stan Groff, yeah, it, the uh, world's leading researcher on LSD came to the chapel. And, uh, I, and, uh, this is uh, Dr. Hoffman, who d discovered LSD, and uh, here's my portrait of him in uh, 2006. He turned 100, and he signed the back of the painting. So 
the uh, the painting is a relic, which will be on display uh, at the uh, psychedelic reliquary aspect. Lived till he was 102. Yeah. We saw him in, when he was 102 yeah. and when he was yeah. 100. But uh, he um, he supposedly took a small uh, sub dose every day. He was studying longevity. He was a Sandoz mm -hmm. pharmaceutical chemist. Yeah. And he started studying, after he developed LSD, he started studying longevity. And he lived till he was 102, so it didn't work for well. him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's, there's a bunch of people around there. This is my alchemical angel, basically, that's uh, responsible for bringing this miracle back. I think it's the uplifting back. myself. I think it's the uplifting. Yeah. You know, it's like the feeling of uplifting. It exactly. just keeps you going. Well, it came out. It's a pretty miraculous story how it came about. You should look into it if you're interested. But the, uh, uh, he, he discovered uh, LSD in 1938 and then put it on a shelf, basically because it didn't do anything to the animals, not the things that he wanted it to. Of course, the animals were going, what the hell? You know, but... They couldn't write up a report. <laughs> I, I united with the guinea pig god. Uh, yeah. But uh, now, and five years later, so he's forgotten totally about this, he hears a voice calling him, telling him to remake this medicine. And as he does, on the 16th of April, 1943, the middle of the war, you know, it's kind of a mess over in Europe. There in Switzerland, you know, he's in Basel. At any rate, uh, something weird happens, and he has a funny experience that only lasts a few hours, he says. Now, nobody has a few-hour LSD experience, so nobody can explain this April 16th thing. But on the 19th, he goes back. It was a Friday. Monday, the 19th, he goes back. And at 4.20 on 4.19... It's in his journal. He wrote it at 4.20. He took the uh, medicine, and within an hour, he thinks he's dying. And, you know, he's like, uh, and, but he doesn't want to die in the lab. You know, so he takes a bicycle ride, the famous bicycle ride back home, to die at home. And, uh, but instead, he just uh, rebirths consciousness. Don't, 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 don't leave the story. I want you to tell. Uh -huh. he, he laid down, and the lady next door was a doctor. She came over, and she said, Albert, you're not dying. Your, your pulse, your eye, your, your, your pupils, pupils are a little dilated, but, you know, you're not dying. You're, you're okay. You, everything's okay. Just relax. So the, so the crisis passed, and he realized he, he went back to a time when he decided to be a chemist and remembered how when he was young, he would go through the fields and see how everything was made of chemicals and how it inspired him to become a chem chemist. So, I mean, he writes all about, you know, this inspiration that happened Absolutely. on the first style of Now, he trip. felt like it was such important uh, potential for humanity. And uh, after that, yep, uh, COSM, uh, our organization, uh, received the relic of... Uh, his glasses that he wore when he mixed up the medicine and took his famous bicycle ride. Uh, so the lenses through which he saw reality change will be on exhibit at uh, Entheon. And, uh, hmm. We may, we may pass. Yeah, just, in, just because of uh, time, he's basically... Can we go back? Okay. I'll read it. Yeah. I will stand up. Okay. Alienation from nature and the loss of the experience of being part of the living creation is the greatest tragedy of our materialistic era. It is the causative reason for ecological devastation and climate change. Therefore, I attribute absolute highest importance to consciousness change. I regard psychedelics as catalyzers for this. They are tools which are guiding our perception toward other deeper areas of our human existence so that we again become aware of our spiritual essence. Psychedelic experiences in a safe setting can help our consciousness open up to this sensation of connectedness, connection and of being one with nature. LSD and related substances are not drugs in the usual sense, but are part of the sacred substances which have been used for thousands of years in ritual settings. 
the classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline are characterized by the fact that they are neither toxic nor addictive. It is my great concern to separate psychedelics from the ongoing debates about drugs and to highlight the potential inherent to these substances for self-awareness as an adjunct in therapy and for potent, let's see, adjunct in therapy and for fundamental research into the human mind. It is my wish that a modern eleusis will emerge in which seeking humans can learn to have transcendent experiences with sacred substances in a safe setting. I'm convinced that these soul-opening, mind-revealing substances will find their appropriate place in our society and in our culture. Dr. Albert Hoffman, April 19, 2007. Thank you for letting me read that. I, I, I feel really called. Thank you. Sasha, Change is possible. Absolutely, and he he knew it. Uh, Anne and Sasha Shulgin and uh, MDMA. This is uh, he's kind of the godfather of MDMA, and uh, he discovered uh, over 200 other psychedelic uh, medicines as he well. Tested them. Yeah, and uh, here because of the great uh, success with PTSD in both rape victims and and uh, the uh, young men coming back from war. Uh, just in January of uh, this year, the British Journal of Psychiatry, which I was told uh, is a fairly conventional journal, uh, put my painting on the cover and gave uh, a big uh, boost to psychedelic psychotherapy. It's a hopeful sign. It is. And uh, DMT is spirit molecule. There's Rick Strassman, enough said. DMT experience. This is going to be on exhibit at Entheon. And it's so big. It's 13, it's over 13 feet tall, so it's rarely been exhibited outside of our studio a few times, yeah. but not as often. And, and it didn't make it into the chapel in New York City because it was too tall. We didn't have a ceiling tall enough for it, so now we do. Basically. You'll come and see Entheon. You'll, yeah. well, anyway. It's an artwork that grew out of my first DMT journey yeah. and later ones. Uh, inspired me to go here and uh, this is kind of planetary consciousness becoming cosmic consciousness through human consciousness and then discovering the beloved in the cosmic web and seeing that we're all connected and uh, one net of being and from this vision uh, I had a vision of the temple a kind of a fractal temple because uh, of that shape that the beings created between them. And we want to build this in uh, physically somewhere. So we had to find property. So we did. Uh, this is when we were in New York. We, we knew that we were going to have to find property because our community was growing, not shrinking. It was obvious that we needed to go to somewhere where we had permanent uh, home. The new all uses, um, we wish. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, right now it's about 40 acres, and we superimpose a goddess figure over the land, and, it, and her heart winds up in amazing places, like the pulpit uh, for the heart, and the yoni is the opening to go into the meadow and things like that. The, the, good, the good news about it is how, what a miracle it is to have found 40 pristine wooded acres like that you know, 65 miles from New York City, accessible by train. So you can, like, get off the train and walk there. It's just like it's a miracle. It just happened to us. It's but like got, Shark Cathedral from Paris. And it's got this Paris, meadow. It's you know. got this meadow, which is perfect for the, for the, the chapel. chapel. But right yeah. now, we right. have Kate Rodenbush's sculpture there. And she did this sculpture for Bernie Man. It's two stories. You can climb up in there, and we have it at Cosm. She's loaned it to us for a long time, and we're going to, you know keep it as long as she'll let us, and uh, one day the, the chapel will be built in that meadow. Meanwhile, there's oh. the house. Oh, other stuff that we do. We full, built, we, we restored three three buildings already. We're working on number four. This yep. is full where moons. we hold full moon ceremonies. Yeah, Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets. Met there. 
Uh, bees, we have, we have bees. bees. We, we have weddings. Weddings too. Uh, we baby have baby blessings. blessings. Yeah. Stuff See, we like became that. a church, Woo! but you know, we never, we didn't have this intention to become a church. We just started doing everything that churches do, including. Teaching. We have art classes there. Yeah. But a long time ago, it was a church. It was a church for 50 years before we got there. And these are some of the people, the black and white ministers that... Early civil rights movement. 1959 would share the pulpit together before, you know, civil rights movement even had its day. Yeah. So radically welcoming people have always been there. And God first spoke to us here. That's what the, that's what the United Church of Christ says. So this, this is, is our sun altar beginning. Pantheon, place to discover God within. A sanctuary of visionary articosm. This is a design that uh, I had an inspiration on. Uh, uh, 2012, I think, I saw. Allison and I were painting paintings of these heads all connected, and you could see that how the solar... Uh, Alter had heads connected and everything, so it's kind of an obvious thing. But uh, each one of these god heads has a different world religion in the uh, in its forehead, and it's on a hill. See, so it's got two story on one side, and uh, and then three story uh, on the uh, entrance level. So this is the entrance. And you'll probably have this uh, kind of evolutionary. Uh, development going up there and then facing uh, mortality, you know, like what are we going to do with the world, you know, uh, we've gotten to this point. So there's, uh, uh, we're trying to reimagine the, brand new. the we're interior you right up to front, the front door. Here. Yeah, this we're is the pop out. Working on the uh, uh, little opening, uh, retooling the opening to the front door. So it'll have it's still some, being it'll, designed yeah. while it's being built. Yep. Yep. Because the walls are up and the roof, we're going to see the roof in a minute. Yep. This is the, uh, the idea is we're going to make a concrete skin that will be attached to an armature that will attach in panels to, the, to a box. This is the box. It was a carriage house in uh, 1882. Eight, built in 1882. Yeah. yeah it's got its yeah. thing right up, up there. And uh, we poured foundations expanding the building, kind of incorporating the building. So we've got new uh, building structure, and this is the Magi Gallery that will exhibit the International Visionary Art Tribe. And that's the front door that you saw the angel opening. Okay. So this is, anyway, uh, earlier uh, this year. And so Very exciting now we're up. for us that we're this far along that we have a box. Yeah, it's but a box. now the box has a roof. <laughs> 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 this is what we're bringing you right up to the moment. The box has a roof. Yeah. And it's getting, it's getting all enclosed for the winter because it's really freaking cold up there. Yeah. And uh, the room that we want to put the sacred mirrors in, we want to put uh, some kind of scaffolding up there on the ceiling. So we this had to model, take out the, the old roof. Yeah, this is an old, uh, a model. So that's the room that it's going to be oh, in. Oh, look, you got is the, the most recent pictures. Yeah, right? yeah. So we've got the trusses up there. By next week, by the uh, time next week, I guess, uh, or in the next couple weeks, we're going to have that all It'll covered be up. It'll be Yeah. But then, you know, we'll work out the truss or the uh, crisscross cathedral-y kind of ceiling in there. Um, we got doors for the chapel that are probably going to be on exhibit somewhere in Entheon, but are uh, going to be made into bronze doors eventually. Um, well, we for decided at some point to start from the inside out. We didn't have the money to get the building yeah. or any or weren't ready for it, so we started designing doors and other things for it. Yeah, this will be the front door to Entheon, I think. Creating a better world. It's kind of Adam and Eve. They've come back to the uh, garden. And uh, there's a lot of mushrooms and other trees of life growing in the garden. And they're creating a better world with their little paintbrushes. And uh, there's a lot of nice detail on this, including a solar field and, and uh, uh, wind turbines and lots of deer and, and stuff. And you see this idea of the chapel up there that's coming along, which we want to build someday. So, hey, that's us, Cosm. Thank and, you. Uh,
We know, you know we want you to come visit. This is why we, we come here to talk to you about this. This is a global activity. This is something that people from all over the world come to work with us and help us. And, and, and every time people come and we have events there, it is, um, well, it's, 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 it's the world helping us build COSM because it's, every activity is a benefit for COSM. Thank you. you. You know, it's not that far. We just got here. It's three, four hours. It's, we hope to see you. It's yeah. completely doable. Sign up for a newsletter or something, you know. Find out what's going on. Or it's a pilgrimage. You know. Yeah. Thank you. That was very fascinating and inspirational. That was great. Um, I think we want to take questions. Yeah, a few questions. We have a little time. Does anybody have questions? Yeah. Okay. Alex up here. Um, Jessica, you have the microphone? You want to talk here? <laughs> Good. Hello, everyone. It's an honor. Um, I'm a student in nursing here. Um, you talk about the sacred space for being available for the experience. Um, I wonder how you envision that. Because I think like in a nursing field with a cultural sensitivity to the different cultures and people is in such a unique experience and I wonder how to respect that involving the concepts of um, geometry and how to organize this space and locate the people through the experience. Well... I think that the uh, I've studied the approaches of a lot of different world uh, religions, and many of them have incredible systems uh, for designing temples. Some of which I I kind of wish I could have adopted, but we were. Given our situation, we um, are allowed to build in this portion of our property and we're basically renovating something. And so it isn't a complete redoing. We're working with what we have. We're integrating it in some really exciting ways, like the old building will... It has amazing stonework and stuff, and so we'll exploit some of the bricks and the idea of coming into a, a church. It totally looks like the... It's amazing, some of the things, but, 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 the, but it's eccentric, and it's not according to the uh, traditions. We were working with what we have, in a way, recycling some, and uh, creating new spaces that are... They're going to be, uh, all of the aspects are going to be controlled in lighting. We're, we don't have any windows. So that's not a traditional way of, of doing a sacred space at all. And that's not true. The pyramids don't have windows. Well, I guess you're a right. A lot of the temples. Well, maybe it's a very traditional. The temples caves. often don't have windows. Yes. It's an inner experience. Huh. Yeah. You're going to yeah, have an incredible right. outer experience of our land. It's a it beautiful wooden. But what I wanted to say to you, though, was that, that if, you, if you wanted to gather spiritual community around you, say you wanted to do something, the way it happened for us was we started full moon ceremonies. We started it with our friends, our 10, 15 friends, you know, we, we just invited them all to come to a certain time, you know, and everybody was supposed to bring something, something to share, poetry, wisdom, uh, music, um, all kinds of things people shared. And so we, would, we did that, and uh, that happened a few months in a row where we invited just our friends, and then we put it on the Internet. I mean, you know, it so happens that the sacred mirrors were kind of like, you know, a few of them were littered around, and some of Alex's best work and mine were littered around the loft. So we would move all the furniture out of the way, and we would... Well, the first time we, we put it on the Internet, we got 35 people, and then we got 75, and then we got 125. And then there was, like, shoes, like, from the outer door all the way up our stairs and all the way up to our... It was just hundreds of people coming. 
So then we had to get a public space. So I think it evolves, is my answer. And that you, but you have to start gathering for a purpose. And our purpose was to build, our mission for COSM, Chapel Sacred Mirrors, is to build an enduring temple to inspire a global community. So that's why we keep traveling and making it global. People's, people's energy, that they come there and that they donate and that they buy Alex's art and that they, whatever it is, it goes towards building this temple. So it's an offering for people beyond our life, beyond just selling the work to individual collectors. It's there for our Love Tribe community, people who love the work. The so, but anyway, it's, it started with a prayer. And there was a gathering. It was to get together and pray for a temple. That was exactly it. It was the it was the the seed Shopping planting the seed of a it. of a sacred uh, space. So it has a sacred intention, sacred purpose. Um, so yes, yeah, that creates the sacred space. on my phone, for example. Oh, I love that. <laughs> One of the pieces that interests me most from you, Alex, is the uh, deities and demons drinking from the milky pool. And it kind of addresses this idea that um, we're three-dimensional beings in physical bodies, but there are beings on other dimensional levels of reality that are kind of feeding off of our energy or, or trying to work through us because they don't have physical bodies. And I just kind of wanted to get a little more information from you about what you think about that. Oh yeah, it's it's a juicy topic, uh, which is um, given the strength and power of the uh, psychedelic experiences that people have, and the um, frequency of encountering beings of one kind or another, either seem to be um, positive and uplifting. Uh, beings or beings that seem threatening and uh, now the Tibetan Book of the Dead would call them the peaceful and wrathful deities you know uh, there are contexts that the sacred traditions have set up to work with these states of consciousness and awareness and uh, they acknowledge that these beings are fabrications of your own imagination you know, and that they're teachers that are coming to open you up. And so you could have that context, if you like. And uh, But the actual experience of the painting was a time when, once again, we took a lot of LSD. I was, it was actually quite a bit. Uh, and I... And, uh, I got two paintings out of that one, yeah. um, the Deities yeah. and Demons and the Theologue painting, and both came out of that. This is a guy meditating in a field with big perspective grid. Well, we had rate. a bunch of people at our, at our loft that were having this experience together in a group, and, it, and, and the energy was quite um, wild. It was intense. It was intense. Not, not our choice to have it be like that. No. Set in setting. I mean... I would, I would much rather. One of the guys, peaceful, but you know, uh, Walter Houston Clark. He, he was at the Good Friday experiment. Yeah, Walter Houston Clark he was, he held the ceremony in our loft. He wrote the book Chemical Ecstasy, and he was a Harvard theologian. Yeah, and, and he wanted to hold this group experience, and uh, it was in what, like seventy. 78, 78 or 70, yeah. yeah. And, and so we knew none of the people that were there. It was a bunch of people. It was an hour loft because we had a big loft with a <laughs> music system and some big Oopsie. rugs. And it ended up in the, in the middle of the city, and we, we ended up you know, having it. But uh -huh. it, 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 it came up with an amazing set of paintings for you. Yeah. Well, but I saw those beings. that They were some, somehow, symbolically, all the people in the world were uh, on the edge of this electric pool of milk and whatever it was that they were doing in their life was actually kind of set up for them to create and experience certain emotions and certain feelings and those were the food of the gods 
that they were lapping up and that they had arranged a special feast uh, uh, at our gathering. Right. There was a lot so of laughing and them. crying and carrying on going on, which is not always the case with group experiences, but there was, and there was you know, nudity and there was insanity and all kinds of craziness going on there. And uh, that brought in, and it brought us to both like want to be just completely centered and silent and kind of like meditate the whole time. So you were like sitting in meditation. I was lying in meditation the whole time. But you saw all of these the energies going around. on and that the gods had yeah. set it all up mm-hmm. so that they could <laughs> suck up the energy from our group. Awesome. Yep. I don't know. Does it happen? You know, look, uh, we have plenty of friends who are doing a daime down in Brazil and stuff, and, and they're working with the spirits. Or are the spirits, like, taking a ride on them? Working through them. And yeah. working through them and things mm-hmm. like that. Look, That's Socrates... That's they dance and sing, though, because it yeah. channels that creative energy. I feel like not having any structure in our in our, you know, 1978 experience, I think... You know, like a lot of energy was stirred yeah. up. It wasn't enough of a sacred setting. I would, I would put more structure on something like that. Nevertheless, I, I had an amazing experience. And so sometimes these things where they're catharsis and you, it's all mental in your head, you know. Mostly it's just a raging thing going on there, you know. And you're going to be okay. You know, it feels like you're going to die, you know, but you're... It, you're actually leaving something, you're shedding a skin, a, a boundary that you hadn't gone beyond. And so those beings sometimes will meet you there. And if you're not careful, perhaps a number of people, and perhaps this is what the, the borderline personality that should never be taking psychedelics mm-hmm. is experiencing, that they're... They're halfway there already. This is kind of like, eh, you know, it kind of pushes them too far over into the, now I'm into the multiple dimensions, and they don't all look friendly. I don't know. But you know, you know they're, they're so even doing studies now where they're, they're testing uh, with, with schizophrenia. They're, they're thinking of using psychoactive uh, drugs or, they're, or they're, they're testing it. And I think that in, that's, a, that's this, a special medical setting where people can watch over people and actually take them through an experience. Maybe there's some uh, help to be had there. And right now, we don't know because they're, they're still doing the research. But it's very, when it, when it affects the mind, I, 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 it's affecting all kinds of addictions. It's really helping people. Yeah, and they're, if, if they're working with spirits, getting hooked up with the right tribe of, of spiritual influences, you know. It's like, think of the spirits that feed off of your depression and your despair, you know. It's like, that's one kind of tribe, you know. Maybe the ones that are all about the joy and uplifting and things like that, the ecstatic, visionary, mystical experience, that's a different tribe. So I, th- I think that people are working with spirits all the time. You know, Steiner thought that, you know, you wouldn't be able to understand what I'm saying except through the agency of an angel. And so uh, the, uh, this, we're working with them all the time, but we're unconscious of it. Just like we don't know what our liver is doing, you know. I have no idea what's happening down there in my pancreas, you know, but it's functioning and I'm sitting here talking, you know. You don't have any idea what your visionary physiology is doing, you know. It's a big, strange thing. Thank you. So I've been wanting to ask this question many years. Okay, so I had... This book shortly after it came out, 15 years ago, okay, Sacred Mirrors. And uh, let's see, I was a, a bhakta for a long time, and then I became a chassid. And then I woke up like four years ago and found myself to be the senior rabbi of the temple down on the edge of Wynwood. And it has, 
it has this amazing chapel that you have to see. It's, it's definitely psychedelic. It's called the Chapel of Light. So it's just, you'll see it. Uh, you should come and see it. Anyway, uh, in your painting Gaia from 1989, um, there's the image of the Twin Towers and an airplane just over it. It seemed to be like a premonition. So did that ever come up? Uh, did anyone ever ask you about that? Like, you know, it's right there. It's just like an obvious symbol. It's a rabbit hole. <laughs> it really is. It's one of the deepest, weirdest uh, things that's ever uh, happened to me. 9-11, uh, for some reason, has a very uh, historic uh, impact that's made on the human psyche, on the American psyche, for sure, but also throughout the world for a variety of reasons. Um, so on um, November 15th, uh, 1985, or 88, 88 uh, our daughter was born. And as I was holding her, I had that vision, basically. Well, you know, what kind of world have I brought my daughter into, I had this kind of, of course we'd been up for three days, I mean that might explain something, but uh, the, uh, it, it was like all at once like, oh God, you know, I'm bringing this, you know, beautiful, pure soul into this potentially horrifying uh, splatter fest, you know, of the world. And the, uh, so, Zena was probably, what, seven or so, or I don't know how old she was, maybe a little older, what, on 9-11, uh, 2001. But this book she came was out like, in, in 1990. Yeah, it was 1990. 1990, so the book came out. Well, then the Beastie Boys used the uh, image in their Ill Communication album, and the, um, the Grammy Award-winning hit from that album was Sabotage. I know you planned it, uh, you know, this Watergate, you know. It says things like this. Okay. Um, now, the number of, uh, it, you could get the net of being as the recent book. There's a chapter in it or a little page that says, Remembering 9-11 Before It Happened. This is Alex's most recent book is the net of being. And it has an entire section on that topic. I just want you to know that. Take a look at it. We might have some copies here tonight. But anyway, it talks about other other artists that also had a premonition. There were quite quite a number. Quite of Quite a number of them. The most surprising of which was a uh, artist who um, stayed over uh, the night before and uh, thus was there that morning. A lot of artists had studios, actually, in, in uh, the Twin Towers. And uh, so he was killed instantly, this uh, Michael Richards. Richards, yeah. And uh, he was a black artist. He was a sculptor. And a couple months later, a self-portrait sculpture is found down in a museum in South Carolina. North Carolina. Uh, okay. And... <laughs> and uh, you wrote it it's in your self book. I mean, okay. I just wanted to clarify. Thank it's you. It's in there. All right. It's a, it's a self-portrait uh, as like uh, St. Sebastian, but instead of arrows, it's airplanes going through his body. Life-size self-portrait with airplanes going into him in bronze. So a lot of strange synchronicities all pointing to this one very stinky, kind of not-so-right event. Like, why did God select all these artists to point to this one moment? There was a musical group. This hit the news wires shortly, like on 9-11 or 9-12. You could look for it. It was a hip-hop group named The Coup. And it was uh, to be released on 9-11, but they couldn't release it once this had happened because there's the two artists... And there they have like little plungers, and the Twin Towers are exploding. You know, it looks just like the photos. Uncanny. 
was to be released that day. The coup. Okay, Dream Theater, a, a, a group in Boston, still around, released their live from New York album on 9-11, and it had the Twin Towers in the center surrounded by flames. Now, I, I've met so many artists with so many uncanny uh, connections with this. There was definitely a big psychic seeding just like the uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind kind of mountain experience, you know. A lot of people got it. And uh, why? That's the big question that nobody wants to answer. Yeah. Well, let's not end on that. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Hi, um, my name's Holly. Um, I just really wanted to say, like, oh, this is rude. <laughs> um, as an artist um, myself, like, I just wanted to say, like, thank you just so much for your artwork because of the fact that spirituality is a very important part in life in general. And, like, I remember my first experience in finding myself and myself in spirituality. And I remember when I did, I actually had one of your books with me, and um, he was with me too. And I remember when I saw your artwork, I literally burst into tears. Like, I, I just did, and I connected with it so much, and I was just like, wow, like, there's an artist that, like, gets it, you know? And then from that, from just seeing, like, you, like, your artwork, I, it totally blasted off into, like, the spirituality and, like, this, um, like, how do I say it, like this path that I've been taking since I was like 15. And now at like 21, I go to school, I'm a full-time art student, and I remember I wanted to be a nursing major, and I suck at math, I hate, I hate blood. And, <laughs> and I was like, what am I doing? And I just really, and I always, I have about 47 journals and sketchbooks and all throughout my life, and I'm just like, I'm supposed to be an artist. And it was through spirituality and seeing your artwork that, made me want to be an artist and be the best I can be. And it's not only the fact of being an artist, it's also getting a message across. It's like, this is important. And finding yourself in spirituality and the way you speak about psychedelics, and they're not drugs, they're medicines and they help you and they help you find yourself and where you need to be in life. And like, I just really want to say thank you. Wow. I honor you. I thank you. Yeah, you're just a really big part of my life. You and Allison, your love together is just so beautiful. I saw you guys at Moksha in 2013, cried my eyes out, and I just, I really wanted to say thank you. Like, this is really great that you guys oh, are here. So much love. Thank yes. you. Thank well, the long-term so relationship is really worth it. That's my report. Oh, yeah. It is. It really is. It's great to have somebody at our age that knows you as well as we do, even even though we don't always agree, and we have to negotiate all the time. It's just great to have somebody there who, who's known each other as long as we have. And I just wanted to say, because I know we're going to probably want to go out there and do some signing of people. Or we have, have to, to leave or something. Or we have to leave or something. But I just wanted to say that, you, that it is possible, if you know someone who would like to study art with Alex and I, if you know somebody who, who is an artist, and, and, and maybe it's you, it is possible to do that, and it happens. It really does. So just just go to our website, cosm.org. That's where we teach. We teach there. The Magi, the Mystic Artist Guild International, is our educational nexus, and we teach, you know, Alex might teach a, another anatomy workshop. He taught anatomy at NYU for 10 years, and now he does a very special seven-day intensive. If you are using the figure in your art, you really owe it to yourself to learn the anatomy to make it, you know, all that much more convincing and, 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 and dynamic like Alex's work is. And you can learn a lot about abstract art from us, too. But we have all kinds of art going on. So just check out what we're doing and come and be with us. We teach once a month at our church. So if you want to just take a, a one-off one class, just see what it's like to study with us, come to our church. Um, in time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you so much. This has been great. We're going <laughs> to.